Conjuring the Movie. Our lives have been devastated by the release of this movie. The movie industry and all involved never bothered to consider the consequences to us, never told us that the movie was going to be made and that how it may affect our lives. Even when they were informed about the horrendous experience that we were facing, no one bothered to contact us. I am the current owner of the farm where the parents lived during the alleged events of the 1970s, when the Warrens also became involved with the family. Only due to the presence of the Warrens were this movie created. When I discovered the parents' name and the name of the town was used, I was infuriating. It was then that the realization how the occult followers was able to so quickly gain our personal and private information. We will never feel safe or secure again. We have forever lost our sense of peace and privacy. And as long as we live here, we will never feel that peace and for anyone else in the future. We were left on our own to cope with this assault. We are so angry and frustrated. We are experiencing anxiety and stress when we should be enjoying our home and our retirement. It is enough for us to have to deal with serious physical problems without having to face people stalking, harassing, and trespassing at all hours into the middle of the night who believe they have the right to maliciously and willfully invade and violate our home and our lives and to threaten our well-being both emotionally and psych psychologically and physically. We never had to post our property. Now it angers me every time I come and go from our home to have to see what looks to me like a circus with signs all around the property and ropes and chains and flags. But worse, it does not stop the trespasses. Those responsible who created this movie caused this to happen to us, and they do not care. The following information will be in six parts. First, it will be our research about the many claims made by the parents. Next, it will be a history and a research of the Warrens. And then, the history of the times that I thought was interesting and connected to this during the 50s to the 80s. Also, about our life during the assaults. And then, I will mention and talk about the life we had before the movie. And finally, I will discuss past videos that have been made in our home. The movie The Conjuring is complete fiction. I find it amazing how the movie industry can create a movie, claim it was based on a true story, when not a moment has been based on any factual reality. It was left to writers to create their own through their own imagination, never to bother doing v any research, and it was their version from beginning to end. We will move to discussing what Andrea Perrin wrote in her book about her family's experience. We realize many people saw the movie but has not read the books. What is written by Andrea is the basis of the alleged experience which Warrens took and the industry the liberty to misuse. Andrea is very descriptive about the story told by her family. Again, there is no connection to the parents' story in the movie, even if one wants to believe it or not. The significant question we have, the claims about Bathsheba Sherman, and the claims by Carolyn Perrin that murders, suicides, and drownings happened on our property and in our home. So descriptive was Carolyn that she even claimed which room the murder and the suicide happened. Carolyn claims there were suicides by hanging in the barn, not one, but two. We p will prove none of these claims are true. So, why did Carolyn pre create such stories that are totally untrue? What did she gain from it? What was her motivation? Did she eventually believe it herself, or did she purposely deceive those around her? Who was she trying to fool? This should bring into question what other stories did Carolyn create, including the claims of the hauntings. These stories are maintained by the family for over 35 years and included in Andrea Perrin's book. Carolyn had claimed she had done extensive research. If she had, she would have discovered what we have found. It is time to reveal the truth. 
Our home has now been mocked, made a spectacle, and stigmatized forever unless we can put into question what really did happen. The book Andrea Perrin wrote that before, while they lived in Cumberland, their lives were also already disruptive and stressful. This is the main reason Carolyn Perrin was so desperate to move. It was Carolyn Perrin who created the fictitious story about Bathsheba Sherman. The question is why did she want or need to make these claims? She claimed that Bathsheba had been an Arnold. She was not. That she had lived in our home. She did not. She claimed that Bathsheba, when she was young, killed an infant with a knitting needle, and according to her, a hearing was held to see if there was enough evidence to bring her to trial for murder. No evidence of the death or of a hearing anywhere has ever been found, including the Superior Court records. Carolyn claims the community knew all about it and that the townspeople ostracized Bathsheba for actually murdering the infant for sacrifice in a satanic ritual because she was really a witch. That Bathsheba was a, had made a pact with the devil to keep her beauty. No evidence in any historical record or from any local historians. In fact, in Andrea's book, page 298 to 299, she talks about how Carolyn had gone to Chapachet to find the claims of Bathsheba's story and to discuss this with a local historian. Well, we have the local historian who has spoke to us about this time. She never had that encounter, nor does she know about any records in the Chapacha Historical Society or in Town Hall that had anything to do with Bathsheba Sherman. Again, it was not the seat of the time. Bathsheba was born in 1812. Burrowville was incorporated in 1806. None of these claims would have happened nor taken to Japachet. If anything, they would have been taken to the courts in Providence. She claimed she couldn't live any longer, that Bathsheba in her old age, according to Carolyn, hung herself in our bond because of the shame and the anxiety. Bathsheba did not hang herself. We have the records. Bathsheba died of a stroke in 1885. And she did not turn to stone, as mentioned by the parents. She had died in her own home of natural causes. So consistent was the family with this story that Andrea repeats the entire tale in her book, and this myth was brought into the movie The Production of the Conjuring. Lorraine Warren confirms, according to Andrea, that she could see, psychically, that Bathsheba had made a pact with the devil, causing a demon possession within the home. The fact that Bathsheba Sherman's myth has been proven false with extensive research, no one has ever heard these tales until the parents made the claim in the 1970s. Then Carolyn continued to create more stories, claiming that the murder of Prudence Arnold happened in our home that Dexter Richardson owned our farm. All false. The murder was in Ainan Richardson's house in Uxbridge, Massachusetts. The child was found on the second floor by many witnesses. According to Lorraine Warren, she confirms in Andrea's book that she psychically saw that the girl was murdered in the pantry, blood everywhere. Lorraine told the family to seal off the pantry and never enter it again. Carolyn continues by claiming John Arnold committed suicide in our attic. False, he died in tackling the southern part of Bar Barville. Carolyn claimed a Mrs. John Arnold hung herself on her barn. Also false, Susan Arnold, or Mrs. John Arnold, hung herself in her attic in her own home on Harrisville Road in 1866 at age 50. So why need to fabricate such tales? She claimed extensive research? I don't think so. What she appeared to have done is read the Black Book of Burville, took any name of Arnold, and claimed the deaths happened here in our home. She also adds a father and son ghost named ba Baker Boys were haunting, then because they drowned on our property. There is no evidence. There has never been a suicide, 
murder, or drowning on our property, even beyond the parents claimed. The Warrens and other paranormal groups claim, of course, that a sudden or violent death is the cause for hauntings. Well, apparently, in all the records we went to, both in Chapachet and Burrowville and Douglas and Uxbridge and Providence, found no connection to any of these violent deaths. To continue the history of Bathsheba Sherman, she lived in the Ironstone area of Burrowville as a child. She did not marry until age 32 to Judson Sherman. At that time, she moved to Collins Taft Road in Harrisville. After Judson's death, she married Benjamin Green from Lincoln. That marriage lasted only three years. And when she died, the family decided to bury her in the family plot with her first husband, with her father and mother. She had had four children with Judson. Three died young, apparently of natural causes. Her son Herbert outlived her and married and had children of his own. He inherited the property. We have the articles referring to her funeral and will. And when we found that someone who has had a notorious history is often referred to at the time of the death in the newspapers. But no story was written referring to any past notorious history of a Bathsheba Sherman. Her funeral and burial was conducted by A. H. Granger, a Baptist minister of the First Baptist Church of Providence, well-renowned church, and also conducted its ministry for the Harrisville Baptist Church. I doubt that the Baptists would have accepted Bathsheba as a parishioner if she had been accused of witchcraft or murder or an infant uh, by satanic rituals. In fact, if Carolyn believed the black book, she would have seen that Bathsheba was not in the book because she died of natural causes, not from hanging herself, and no claim of a death of an infant from the knitting needles. The black book was a list of unusual deaths in Burrowville since 1797 until 1950s, and others were added up until the 1990s. Andrea claims Bathsheba's history was in Japachet. It was not. Parents claimed... Mr. Kenyon, who sold the house to them, did not tell them about the hauntings. Well, the Kenyon family has left letters with the historical society and with me that their home that had been in their family for 200 years has not been nor ever has been haunted. In fact, in the book, Andrea makes claim that Mr. Kenyon took Roger aside to tell him for the sake of your family, keep the lights on at night. Now, Jerry and I actually laughed about this at the time we read this because our house of 11 rooms had one bathroom. The bathroom was at the far end of the house on the first floor. If you were upstairs at the other end of the house in a bedroom, or even if you were downstairs in the bedrooms, which they used, which was at the other end of the house, it would be much safer to leave some light on in order to get your way to the bathroom, in which Jerry and I have done for 26 years. We leave the light on in the kitchen, in the middle room, so that we can go from room to room without having to look and search for light switches. There are other names, too, particularly, that had unusual deaths connected to the farm. One was Edward Arnold, an original homeowner in the 1850s. He had turned over the farm to his daughter, Abigail Butterworth, in the late 1800s. He was found frozen to death near Sherman Farm Road in 1903. Apparently, he had taken a trolley so far and began to walk. He either passed out or fell asleep against a stone wall and froze to death. His body was not found for about three months. Then there is another case. This case was of Jarvis Smith, who was found frozen to death in a shed on the farm down by the power lines far from the home. But it was on the road and on its way from Shang Bailey's bar room. Apparently he had been drinking, sought refuge in the shed, fell asleep, and then died. This was in 1901. But the interesting thing of Jarvis's story is that in his newspaper article, 
It also referred not only about his death, but of a notorious history. He had been accused of a murder, but was not found responsible. But why I mention this is because, again, I refer to people who have had a notorious history. They would also mention that history along with the death. I also want to mention in this video, she mentioned that Dexter Richardson owned the house. And as I have proven in all my information, Dexter Richard never owned this property and did not live here. And the reason she put that in the video is to try to emphasize the murder of the Prudence Arnold that I have also dispelled that never happened here. It happened in Uxbridge. But it was her, again, her belief of what her mother claimed that there was a connection between Prudence murder here, and it was not here, and the ownership of Dexter Richardson, which he never did. The other thing I want to mention, which I discovered when we were doing research, is I had forgotten that in 1997, the Providence Journal had come to Boroughville and asked the local historian for any stories about local hauntings. Well, the historian mentioned this house because this was only 10 years after I had met her and known he's about seven, oh, I would say 17 years after the parents had moved out. But what I found interesting is that the historian actually quoted me. She said my name and then said that when I was asked, I said, there is nothing that ever happened here that couldn't been explained by other means. And she quoted that. And that's how I had always felt. And I thought this was an also important to tell you. I'm going to mention some of the stories that I heard that Andrea Perrin. I personally heard her say some of these stories in public, but I also heard her on the internet speaking on different radio stations. Andrea Perrin said in public that Warner Brothers had given us full security. Well, that is absolutely false. Warner Brothers had never talked to us. They also claimed at another public hearing that the Warner Brothers had paid our local police department. Those claims are also false. I was also told originally by her that her and her family had nothing to do with the upcoming movie. She told me it was a movie based on the Warren files, that it was based on only what Lorraine Warren had to say, and she and her family had nothing to do with it, that some B-movie producer was making the film and it was going to be some rig film. That's all I ever heard until the movie actually was coming out into public. That's when I, of course, heard that her name and her family likeness and the fact Harrisville, Rhode Island, was going to be mentioned. And it's when I really got upset. And I actually had to call Andrea and explain to her how angry I was. Also, I heard that she claimed that her and her father had arrived here about three years ago, a day that they had brought a reporter with them. I do remember that day. This was long before the movie. I was in a public forum listening to her at one point when I heard her say that she had been viciously attacked by the entity, Bathsheba, while her father was in our cellar here at our house in front of me and this reporter, claiming that I looked shocked when she got thrown across the room and was seriously hurt on her back, etc., etc., well, I never saw any such attack. And the reporter was called outside, and I never saw her again because she left. So I thought it was kind of odd, but never gave it much thought until I heard this story. I was so infuriated. It was right at the week that the movie was coming out. So along with my anger about the video and having my name on it with the access to all my private information and telling this false story along with these others, I sent her an extensive email and had her take that video down, which she did for four months, but then eventually put it back when she heard I was coming out with all the research that I have done. But the interesting thing, on Facebook, that reporter found me. And I am going to quote what she said, and I do have copies of this. She said, and I quote, 
I never wrote the story that day because I felt a fraud was being perpetuated and I wanted no part of it and I believed none of it, end quote. Then, as I began to listen to more videos and recordings and talks of radio stations and articles, I also found an article by the producer Tony DeRosa Grund of New Line Cinema, who was this part as a producer or co-producer to this movie, claiming he had called both Carolyn and Andrea while they were at my home. Carolyn has never come here since I've owned the home. But he claimed that he heard while speaking to them on the phone that dishes were crashing to the floor because the parents' presence had caused the entity to become angry and used my name in the article. That made me extremely angry. Andrea did not mention the name Tony DeRosa Grund until she was in my house on July 23rd when she made the last visit here, right after we had seen the movie two days earlier. Had I heard her mention that name before, I would have in instantly realized she was connected to this movie. Because Tony DeRosa Grun had actually spoken to Andrea six, seven years ago. Talking about wanting to produce a movie, I had never heard of him or his studio. But whatever they were supposed to be doing, her writing a screenplay, that's what she told me, it all fell apart. Apparently he never paid her, and supposedly that was the story, and that he never got funding to do any movie. I never realized he was connected. And like I said, had I known, I would have absolutely known that Andrea was connected. Andrea said, as I was listening, even though she told me she had nothing to do with this movie, I heard her several times in interviews say she has had a contract with the studio for four years, knowing that her name would be on that movie, yet she never told me. There are many other stories that she's put out. Even simple stories like, I have invited her over and over again to stay over at our home, and she could never do it because she could never spend a night here. I have never asked her ever to sleep over here. The other statement I heard, when she spoke to a small group, the people there called me to inform me that Andrea told the group that while I had child care here, a child, an infant, continuously levitated out of a crib and I would continuously find it on the floor. I was very, very upset about that. And then on the, one of the videos she did, she claimed that Jerry, who was so frightened of his study, had never been in it for years. And I absolutely defended that, that she, obviously, his study is his most favorite place. And then I began to get suspicious. Was she also telling this story in public? I also have an email from her from about two and a half years ago verifying that she said she would do all in her power to protect Jerry and me. When somebody had been at our house who had put things on the internet and that had to be taken down and she was all for protecting our privacy, yet that did not happen. It's also interesting to mention several times Andrea mentioned in her book a Mr. McEachin. On interviews when asked about him, she said that she never used his real name because she never got permission from the family. Well, interesting enough, we know who Mr. McEachin really is, and we have spoken to a family member. So we are aware, so that any story that was coming out from the story, whether or not Mr. McEachin was one of those who talked about Bathsheba, according to the family, they never heard any story about Bathsheba Sherman. I also want to mention that in 1997, there was an article in the Providence Journal. The historian from Boroughville at that time was approached by a journalist asking about any haunted stories at the time. 
she went over some of the story about this house and another story that was famous, interesting enough, it was called Laura Sherman. For a while, we always wondered whether there was some connection of the parents mixing the story about Laura Sherman myth with Bathsheba Sherman, like claims that Bathsheba was never buried in consecrated ground, that she's buried in our backyard. Well, interesting, when we first moved in, my daughter, who was a teenager, when she was in school, this would, of course, only been seven years after the parents moved out. These kids actually said to my daughter, do you know that you have the Sherman buried in your backyard? But they said it was Laura's grave. But Laura's grave is actually up in Buck Hill, not anywhere near this area. So the confusion, whether it was the parents or the townspeople, the interesting that these two myths somehow were mixed. I'm now going to speak about claims of the Warrens. The history of the Warrens is interesting. When I began to do a thorough research, as much as I could find at the time, and I'm sure there's a lot more out there, we will start with the Amityville Horror. The book was written in 1977. It was very interested that the Warrens became involved because of the newspaper in the area who asked them to come and do an investigation. They claimed that the George Lutz family had already left when they came in to investigate. And of course, the Warrens discovered there were demons in the house. Not surprising. A next case in the 1980s, they investigated which became a movie called The Haunted. It was the Smurl family story. Again, I require that everybody do research if they want to find out about Warren's history. Apparently, there was a question about the Smurl's hallucinations and whether or not he had actually brain lesion. The next one that became quite famous made for TV is The Haunting in Connecticut. It's the Snedeker story. A book was written by them. It was written by a man named... Ray Garten. It was later found that after the story was written, Ray Garten came forward and claimed he had made up the story, including claims that Ed Warren told him to fabricate the story. The Ray Garten had claimed that he had tried to get information from the family, but no one had a similar story, and it was too confusing, and that's when Ed told him just to make it up. Going back to the Amityville Horror, the man who wrote the book, the Amityville Horror, Jay Anson, he also eventually came forward and confessed that a lot of it was just fabricated. But the story that I heard that was to me the most disturbing, a book written by the Warrens called Devil in Connecticut, the book claimed that Lorraine Warren found this 11-year-old boy to have been possessed by 42 demons. Several exorcisms supposedly was performed on this child. Apparently, I don't know, it doesn't say whether or not he ever really got psychological attention. But as the boy grew up, his name is David Gladzell, he discovered in 2006 there was talk of the book that they wrote, The Warrens, The Devil in Connecticut, to be republished because there was a possibility of a movie being made. Well, David and Carl Gladsell got together, the two brothers, as adults, and sued Lorraine Warren in 2007. The other lawsuit that we had heard about, not pertaining necessarily to the Warrens, but it was filed by the Cromedy family, who moved into the Amity of a house after the Lutzes had left. And due to the continuous harassment of thrill seekers, sued Jay Anson and George Lutz because of the thrill seekers and won the case because it was heard by then that Jay Anson said it was a made up story. And if anybody is going to research or would like to look up more information, about the David Gladsell story, 
there was a great writing from a man called Frank Richards. He did a series about the horrors of the Glatzel's life. And because of the Warrens had claimed this, he suffered greatly, both in his town, he never graduated high school. And this is why I'm very concerned when this type of investigative nonsense can happen. This can hurt and destroy people's life. And I know personally now what this kind of information can do to people. Nothing, of course, what happened to David. And I feel sorry. I wish I had some communication with him. But it's interesting to read these stories if anybody wishes to investigate themselves. And I also added, even though this is not a Warren story, the movie The Exorcist. The name of it is The Haunted Boy by Mark Opsasnik, O-P-S-A-S-N-I-C-K, exposing the real truth of The Exorcist. Also interesting, while I was doing my investigation, I found a video about the Warrens called Spirit of the Woods. It's interesting to know that the Warrens also claimed that they believe in fairies, gnomes, and leprechauns. Now, I even add the interesting thing about how animals are demonized by this. Suggestion is the flies, not only in Amityville, but the parents claim they were attacked by demonic flies. Now, Andrea mentions the word bot flies. Well, bot flies would seriously not be the type of fly that would have been in a New England home at this point. What they were are cluster flies, a very common type of fly that burrows into a house and comes out in through the house during the fall and winter. Yet the paranormal makes these flies apparently demonic, along with crows and bats and snakes and pigs. My question has always been, where is science? especially when there's claims of paranormal, especially now that it is the 21st century. But I have quotes from the Warrens from their book. Quote, there is simply no secular, that is, no non-religious explanation for the spirits to exist. They also may claim that science in the medical field are in denial because schizophrenia is really demon possession. Warrens also claim that during the period of the 70s and 80s, somewhere thereabouts, that 600 exorcisms had taken place. Add that to the local evangelical minister who now claims he has done at least 20,000 exorcisms. The Warrens also say that science couldn't really come to the study of demonology because it is not in their realm. It must stay in the religious realm. Interesting. That is obvious. Science could not find this because only people under the religious idea that demons exist can actually experience this. Scientists, according to, again, the Warrens in their book, scientists rule out the existence of spirits entirely. The medical establishment tends to see the subject as either an illusion or psychosis. Academics conceive of demons as only as fantasy. Only the religious establishment can give credence to the notion of the demonic in high theology. A final note. It is interesting how the Warrens, in their book, make several claims. One I think is interesting where he quotes, people just cling to psychology. Well, I just thought I'd add this. Because of the past where people believed demon possessions, of course when people had delusions, or a psychosis, they quite often in you know, past years, because of the religious connection, would believe that the voices were either the devil or a god. And that's how it had been for many, many generations. But interesting enough, if we just choose to look at psychology, back in the 50s, things began to change. And what some of the psychosis was, claims to be aliens or spies. And if you remember, that was quite popular in the early 50s and 60s. 
But then there is a new psychosis that is being discovered because basically any of these delusions is based on your culture. And quite often, if people study around the world, that whatever the culture belief is, is what the psychosis t tends to follow. But the newest one, and I thought it would be interesting to hear, is called the Truman Syndrome. It's the new disassociative identity disorder behavior. And the reasons, again, the new culture of technology. It is a belief that the psychosis comes from the belief that people are following them because of the videos, because of the technology, that there's been chips implanted in them, and that these through these chips or through this technology, people are speaking to them and maybe causing them to react or to do things against their own will. But again, cultural in its modern days, we are now in the 21st century. According to the parents, in Andrea Perrin's book, the Warrens did not help end their problems. It actually made it worse. Also, the Warrens never protected the parents' privacy. They publicly discussed the parents' story and broke with confidentiality. The parents were also inundated with thrill seekers during their time here. And the parents themselves were even called Satanists by some and rejected by their local church and found difficulty even within the com community. I did request copies of any research that Carolyn Perrin had done, which apparently had been given to Lorraine Warren back in the 70s, but I have never heard back. Delusion, a false conception and persistent belief unconquerable by reason in something that has no existence in fact. The Webster's Dictionary. Another interesting term, the more modern term, is the matrix. Consensual hallucination. The following information will be in six parts. First, it will be our research about the many claims made by the parents. Next, it will be a history and a research of the Warrens. And then, the history of the times that I thought was interesting and connected to this during the 50s to the 80s. Also, about our life during the assaults. And then, I will mention and talk about the life we had before the movie. And finally, I will discuss past videos that have been made in our home. I am going to end with discussion of two videos that had made here at this house over the last couple of years. Eight years ago, the ghost hunters came and filmed. What happened that year, it was a friend of mine who had called to tell me that this it was a new show and that I should probably write to them and let them know that the Warrens had been here in the 1970s. I balked at this originally because I was not interested in ghost hunting shows, but she insisted that these were Rhode Island guys, that this would be so interesting for them at least to know that Warrens had been here. So six months later, I finally said, well, I'll just email TAPS, which is the program that was housed in Rhode Island, and let them know. And what I did is simply write an email telling them that our house had been visited by the Warrens in the 1970s. It was not my intent at the time to ever have any ghost hunters come to our house. We had already lived here 18 years and never had any interest. But interesting enough, two days later, I received a phone call, not from Rhode Island, but from Los Angeles. It was the Sci-Fi Channel. And they were very curious and, and very interested in doing this house and asked, can they come and film? And they needed to do it in two days because they were going to be going around the country and this was going to be their first stop, so they would have to do this immediately. And would we consider them if they could come? Now, interesting enough, had Jerry been here at the time, this probably would have never taken place, but he was away. Because he worked two jobs, he would have had to need his sleep, and this was done on a Tuesday evening. Well, I thought about it, and I hemmed and hawed, and then I finally said to him, well, in my mind, I thought, well, they don't use psychics or mediums, that they only use instruments. And then I thought, well, what are they going to find? So they can come, they can look around, and, you know, figuring they won't come up with anything. So I agreed. 
I thought it would be entertaining to see how ghost hunters are working with, with technology now rather than other forms. So they arrived a day before the shooting, and two women came in and had talked to me. I'd looked around the house, asked a different information, like where was a local restaurant. And then they said to me, well, did you ever have any information or anything ex to experience? So I said to them what we had said in the first two or three years that living in the house, because every sound we would hear because we were told this is an alleged haunted house, we would joke about sounds that we would just say, well, what do you think? Do you think this could be ghost? In fact, I knew nothing of the actual or original story other than that we were told by the realtor it was an alleged haunted house and that what we got from townspeople I assumed was just gossip or not real knowledge at all. So I told them a couple of incidents. So they said to me, could they film me saying these stories? And I said, I don't care, that's fine. So they proceeded to come the following day and they filmed. And of course, I am not told what they supposedly discovered until two months later when they come for the reveal. Now, anybody who had seen this film would have seen when they revealed what they had found on their computer. I never said anything. I just watched. Because, in my mind, I was actually surprised. Because here I am with cameras on me, watching them having an experience that we had not had for 15 years. Not only one, but two. Claiming they felt something on the bed, and in the chair. Now that was something we had joked about 15 years earlier and they happened to be at the one night to experience it again. Plus they claimed of course the bedroom door opening and closing. I had never seen that door open and close and they had a couple of other personal experiences. And I thought this is very strange. So they continued to tell me that they believed this was a house of paranormal and it was haunted. So I went along with it, because what else do you do when you have cameras following you? Never thought anything of it. But I have to give credit to the Ghost Hunters show. They never said the name of the town, nor did they use the parents' name. They briefly mentioned the Warrens by saying, interesting enough, because apparently they don't see them as very credible, because they made a comment on air saying, oh no, not the Warrens were there. And I have to take them with a grain of salt. And this is what they said on air. Now, interesting, after that filming, and it was aired, I did not see another part of this film until it was aired the following year. And it was a scene that was taking place in, the, in our closet. And it was interesting how they tried to display that it was difficult for anyone to open and close the door because there was a mattress in the room. Now, I found that very interesting. That was not discussed to, with me the day of the reveal. And the fact that why would the mattress even impede entrancing and going when it was there and I went in that closet on a daily basis going in and out from one door to the next, which is on the other side of the closet. But I went along with it and I thought it was interesting and we told friends about the movie and showed him and everybody thought it was very interested and you know I would say to people well if you are a believer you would probably think it's a great show if you are a non-believer you would believe it was all faked and if you're in between you would just think it was a very well filmed interesting show which I actually considered it was one of their best film shows. I even joked for a long time that my favorite scene of the whole show was when the giant moth flew into the van during the middle of the night and they thought it was a bat and everybody went hysterical. That, I thought, was very amusing. But I have to remind people, this is made for TV. And of course, over the years, I have talked to people who have had connections to the show and I have been told, again, this is made for TV. The other video, which had aired last year, Andrea Perrin, again, I had mentioned, had never told me she was connected to this movie. I had given her photos of the house for a while so she could put them in her book, and that's what I had agreed to. I had never agreed to anything else publicly. And over the years, we had had conversations here and there. She knew that I was never totally convinced there was such things as a ghost. 
In fact, we had conversations about science and how I was connected to science based on my psychological background and in counseling. And I even had conversations about quantum physics with her and even saying that if I were to believe anything, it might be in the eventual theory of string theory. And that I definitely never believed in demons and devils and all those, I, the other religious icons. I had no interest at all in religious belief. She knew that, and I knew she knew that. And I had also told her that the stories that I had told were in the beginning, in the first three or four years, when this was so novel to say that it was an alleged haunted house. And she knew that over the years. Well, when she came to me, well before the movie, and asked if she could do a video for her personal, for I thought was for her personal use, her father filmed it. And I have to be honest, I am not a technological person. My computer is 13 years old, and I only got an iPad last year because my children gave it to me. I have no, no knowledge of having used any social media. In fact, I never used Facebook until the movie came out in July, in which I had to make a criticism of it at the time. Now, at this point... When Andrea came to me, she asked if she could do a film and that she just wanted me to talk about all those stories I had originally talked about in the beginning years. So I agreed, thinking this was for her personal use. Again, not never knowing or even involved with social media did I think of this going on the Internet. Nor did I have any connection to this movie. As like I say, she said she had no connection. It wasn't even in my mind. So when we talked, and I explained the stories as I had before, I didn't emphasize a lot of things that I actually said in the video. But when I saw comments, I realized people also didn't notice. Because if you are a believer, you will see the parts you want to believe in. If you are a skeptic, you will see the parts that I mentioned that were sounding skeptical. And I did see that in comments from one extreme to another. And I'll explain here for those who had seen the video. When I began, I said, in the early years, and then I said four and a half minutes into the film, that I come from the mind of science. Now, I didn't emphasize that because Andrea already knew what I meant by that. Halfway through, you heard me say also that as we joked about, or jokingly, we said, and then another part, about three-quarters of the way through, I said, I never jumped to conclusion about these things. I also got very annoyed, and people will see how annoyed I was, when Andrea made a comment that Aunt Jerry feared the study and had never gone back. Well, that would have meant 23 years of him not being in his most favorite place. And I went after her right away about that, that that was ridiculous. And, I, you know, why would she even think we feared anything in this house? Because in my mind, she knew what I said. I never claimed for sure these were ghosts, nor did I ever claim I believed in ghosts or the supernatural or the paranormal. This is the way people viewed what I said. And then what happened after that is I didn't even realize that Andrea had put it on YouTube. It wasn't until the following year that my daughter actually had someone tell her they had seen it. And this was just prior to my having the back problem. It didn't even dawn on me what this even meant. Because Andrea had said she wasn't involved in the movie, I never even connected that her name would have any connection. So what happened in July, when I had my new iPad and was able to review all the videos, I realized that this video had been put up with my name on it. It wasn't the content I was concerned about. It was a fact she put my name on it. And when I saw that they were thousands, in fact, the first time my daughter called me, she said she saw 45,000 hits. Then we started to see even more than that. It was at that point, at the end of July, I became furiated by this. In the fact, as I had said before, she had claimed to always have to protect our privacy. Well, why would she put a film up with my name on it, knowing that her name was going to be on the movie, which immediately linked 
her name to my name. Then I realize this is why probably so much of the public got my name so quickly. Well, I emailed her immediately that July. This was shortly after the film. And I said to her, you better take that film down right now. It is because of that film I believe my name is going so viral. And she did. I gave her credit for that. She took it down. And it was down for four and a half months. But at the end of November, when she realized that I had been doing research and I was starting to expose what I had done in the research, someone called me in the beginning of December, told me that Andrea had put the film back up. And what I believe, she did this in spite. Rather than considering my privacy, and rather considering that originally this could have done more harm to us than anything, yet, just to try to save her own face, she put the video back up. I had been struggling with back pain since the retirement. As of December, I developed severe nerve pain and was waiting for an injection, but it did not work. I could hardly walk by February, and I collapsed. I was taken by ambulance to the hospital. I was told there was no other choice but to have spinal surgery. I spent eight days in the hospital, two weeks in rehab, and several weeks at home learning to walk again. My daughter came to care for me, and in May I spent the month with her. I am telling you this because I want people to realize the movie was not on my mind at all. I had far more pressing issues to deal with. It was the first day I was home, when I saw a car come down the driveway next to my car, I assumed the two people were coming to the door. But when that did not happen, I looked out the window and I saw them walking the property and taking photos. They get back into their car and drove away without ever asking for permission. It was that day that I felt I had been invaded. I was furious. Angry that we would have to post our property for the first time in 25 years. The posting, no matter how many signs, meant nothing. We began to witness cars arriving up front day after day, pointing out the house. They were blocking traffic. I called the police. The neighbors were calling the police. Strangers parking in their driveway, driving down our driveway to take photos, even with the signs there, and they drove past it, or they walked past it to take pictures. I had to continue going in and out, make them go away, and when I should be recovering instead of risking my health. I was one of the, it was one of these days when several neighbors were up front with the police and I went up to speak to them that I discovered from a neighbor that they had seen on our property people with flashlights after midnight. It was then I realized it was even worse. Now our anxiety grew knowing that they had absolutely no respect for us. As if they felt they had the right to trespass, as if this was pub public property for their own bidding to do what they wanted. We began watching the windows. We realized that cars were parked behind our barn that were waiting for us to turn our lights off and then trespassed, as if they were stalking. We began to stay awake, turn off our lights and watch, call the police constantly. The police even found them while doing routine drive-bys. We did not sleep for days, up until two or three in the morning, walking from window to window, never having felt, never have I felt so violated. Day after day, I spent looking out the windows. I never sat on our porch the entire summer. My daughter and son had given me an iPad the year, this past year, and this helped for me to start to watch all the interv interviews of the parents in the movie, which I had not even paid attention to prior to the surgery. It is then I also found very disturbing information. False stories were on these videos, which infuriated me. Because my name became public knowledge that our address was everywhere on the Internet, my voter registration, my private phone number and email, another information with addresses as well as our acreage, our signs, our names, somewhere research, someone had researched even our town files. Google Earth with photos and address. But worst, I found people trespassing, filming, and going by no, our no trespassing signs walking on our property, then claiming they will be back at night, and then putting these films on YouTube. Our coming, 
at worst and made most mockery of our home was a person filming the no trespassing signs, walking past them to the house, placing the doll from the movie with a scream and the words, gotcha. Now over 600,000 hits. Threats and comments to do harm to our property. Several friends did their best to try and get some of the sites taken down, but they could not get every intrusion. At this point, our name and address was posted by thousands of people. We had harassing phone calls in the middle of the night. We found our metal fencing had been torn down several times. We put up a chain and ropes to prevent people driving on our driveway. We did not get any sleep until some friends volunteered to sit in their cars in the driveway up till 3 in the morning, calling the police when they saw people coming. Only then did we feel we could sleep. And even then, if we heard sounds, we would get up. One night when police were at the barn taking down license numbers and names of the offenders, we saw others with flashlights at the other end of the property. One night we came home late, found our chain and rope taken down, and another time our rope was cut. That to me is just malicious intent to make us feel threatened. Weather was not a deterrent either, no matter how much rain or in the months of December or January with freezing temperatures and snow. A group of teens near our sheds in pouring rain. We saw people at midnight at 9 degrees. At Christmas during the school vacation, tire tracks in the snow. I even had a physical confrontation with a man who refused to leave, who had brought along his 7-year-old child, and then confronted me, and others who refused and yelled at us. We saw dirt bikes coming from behind our property from the back trails. At first, there were many, many people who others thought were just local, but we were t writing down license plates. And this is what we recorded. This is what we did see. New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Minnesota, Utah, New Hampshire, Florida, North Carolina, many Mass and many Connecticut plates. Our neighbors were as helpful as they could be. If they heard noises at night, they would yell and say they were calling the police. Across, street, across the street, there were teenagers who were doing their best to send people away during the day and night. One young, young man told us a group had a crowbar, and another group had actually threatened him. We found a file on the property, cigarette butts near a barn, even a battery if a as if a flashlight had, been f had fallen. Our rail fence next to our house was down as if someone was trying to look in the window. A person who lived down the street said he was having people in his driveway because they thought his house was the one in the movie. One day, Jerry, who has a heart condition, was walking towards our mailbox when a car from behind him blew its horn continuously, so frightening Jerry that he thought the car was going to hit him. He became extremely agitated. Then he became angry when he realized a person was doing this on purpose just to frighten him. We found people opening our mailbox. Our postman was stopped daily and questioned, people going into the local post office asking questions, where was the house, going to the library and in restaurants bragging that they had either been here or asking where the house was. It was a constant theme in town. I could not go locally without people asking me about it or I would have here conversations about our home. I avoided going to local places for several months, but it was in September when I realized just how draining this had become for me. I was becoming obsessed with watching the windows. I could not even watch TV or read or even enjoy our outdoors. It was then I decided I could not stop the invasion, and it was so emotionally affecting me that I had to do something change. So I realized I no longer could enjoy even my own home. So I decided to leave every day. Even then, when I returned, I would find cars out in the front. I found older people felt I should engage with them about the house and story. I found this annoying, except that I would tell them how their presence was considered stalking and harassment. Then they might apologize and, of course, say they never considered this before they came. Younger people often just ran off if I came out. Again, I cannot emphasize enough the insensitivity of the movie industry and all involved who to this day has never publicly or privately made an effort. It also infuriates us to know that so many people believe this, our home, still contains evil or demons or believe ghosts even exist here. So many people along with us see our property as a beautiful, relaxing, loving place surrounded by natural splendor as well as being a unique, historical, beautiful home with great value. Two reasons at least to be thankful. 
First, we no longer have our horses or our sheep or our dogs or our cats. Knowing people were willing to trespass and break down barriers, what would they be capable of doing to our animals? That would have created even far more anxiety and fear of what potentially could have happened. Thankfully, my child care program closed four and a half years ago. Imagine families having to face daily the type of people besieging our property, knowing that their children would be exposed to this violation. One positive outcome is several of the children, now adults, wrote to me stating their anger about how we had been attacked. This emphasized how much attend attending our program meant to them, saying they experienced wonderful times and felt always warm and comforted by their time here. Like Amityville, we see only continuous effects from this movie from years to come. We will never feel any sense of security or privacy. The threat will forever hang over this privacy for us and anyone willing to live here in the future. We have been contacted by realtors saying how difficult it may be to sell, not necessarily because of ghosts, there are plenty of disbelievers who would love to have this property. But those who want to live in a home threatened by trespasses, never knowing what will potentially happen, would anybody really want to live in a house with that kind of future? If we had a choice, we would donate our home to an historical society for preservation. And who would agree never to allow that ghost hunters to use our property ever again, just to continuously create a spectacle connecting to this movie? The cover of Time magazine, April 1966, Is God Dead? Secular groups pushing for the separation of church and state, beginnings of fear of secular intellectuals with a new reality of human wisdom. We need to look earlier. When in the 1950s we were praising our adva advancements in science, encouraging students to be scientists, America, pushed after Russian Sputnik, makes great advancement in the ability for space travel. America had to catch up to this new technology. Prior to 1950, evolution was not taught in schools. After such court cases as Scope's trial in 1925, but by 1950, evolution became accepted by the general public, yet America begins to fear anti-religious communism with a totalitarian fascist takeover of certain countries. So feared this new godliness focused on by McCarthyism, so that by the 1960s or 70s, with the decade of turmoil, it became painful for many who felt this stripped away their sense of connectedness. This has been embedded by religion for thousands of years. This along with America's identity with patriotism and nationalism. Even immigrants in America who did not fit could find connection in their religious groups. Churches act like community centers when none other exist, for some gives a sense of community and belonging. So those who could not adjust to the new modern times and who had no other option to place to connect with their identity turned to religion or new cults. For others who connected to the emphasis on technology and logic and reason found connection in secular groups. In the 1970s, it fell back into the old stereotype beliefs, the fear of intellectuals, those who brought us originally into the modern 20th and 21st centuries. New intellectuals, agnostics, atheists, non-believers, or humanists, threatened old traditions. Again, so by 1970s, paranoia, hysteria of the demons and Satanism, along with the fears of loss of place and loss of sense of belonging, confused about modernity, turned to religion. But new forms, not what America knew for decades, but to extreme beliefs. When a self-proclaimed authority proposes a belief, it can become detrimental to the advancement of our society and to individuals. Others need to question and ask about facts, especially when available, to debate the difference between belief and factual research. We need to look closely at statements, like, for instance, you may in time forget about the story which is now apical to your life, but is apical to someone and should not be forgotten. Like all minorities who have been imposed upon, at least respect what they had to be endured.